Grade 11 IT Theory Software Module 1.2b Software Virtual Memory Virtual Memory is a very interesting thing. It actually allows your computer to think it's got more memory or RAM than what it's really got. So when the operating system runs out of space in RAM, it allocates a little bit of space on the hard drive and pretends that that is extra RAM. Of course, this slows your computer down quite a lot because the hard drive is not as fast as RAM. Um, and, but what happens is when the instructions and data are required by the CPU, those instructions and data that are in the virtual memory, which is on the hard disk, are swapped around with stuff that is in the RAM. And this obviously takes time. So um, when this is happening on a continual basis, you'll see the little light flashing on and off that your hard drive is in use on your computer. And this is called thrashing and you get nowhere and nothing opens or closes and the programs seem to have hung up. And this is when too much virtual memory is being used. It's time to close a few programs. Um, a way around this also is to obviously buy more RAM. Make sure your computer has enough RAM. You will need to use 64-bit software or an operating system in order to have to be able to address enough RAM. Remember we said if a 32-bit operating system is used, the maximum amount of RAM you can address is 4 gigabytes. Um, we are going to talk about the different types of programming languages now. Um, there are some programming languages that are made to talk to the CPU directly and then other operating uh, other languages that are at a high level. So at a very low level, the type of language that talks directly to your CPU is called an assembly language. There are much fewer commands in assembly language than at the high level languages. Um, commands would be something like CMP, which stands to compare. And where you see the CMP with this pink circle, it's comparing AX, which is one of the registers in the CPU, with 97. Or you may have a command like sub, which means subtract. So it's far less user-friendly type of, or programmer-friendly type of code than high-level languages. It is optimized so that your CPU will work as fast as possible. And it's used for embedded code. Remember, embedded code is the code like firmware, which is in your ROM. Then you get high-level languages. That is the, the type of languages that you are probably learning in your IT course at school, like Java or Delphi. These languages are made to be easy to understand. They're not as technical. The commands are more like everyday English. There are lots more commands than in assembly language. And often there is also a library of code which allows you to do nearly anything that you want to do in your programming language. There's probably a library that can do that for you if you research it enough. Things like C++, C, Delphi, Java, Pascal are all high-level languages. Okay, so you've got your high-level language and you've written your code. You now need to convert it into assembly language that the CPU can understand it. And for that, you're going to need either a compiler or an interpreter. So a compiler will take the whole program and translate it into machine language. If it finds any errors, then it's going to show you where the errors are so you can first correct them. And once it's finished correcting them, it will generate an executable file 
which is the assembly language code that your CPU can, can um, run. Compilers are used for languages like C++ and Delphi. An interpreter will be um, will take one line of code at a time, translate that, and then execute it. Takes the next line, translates that, and then executes it. It's almost like an interpreter doing live interpretation for someone from, say, English to French. So this is Python. Java and Scratch are all done using interpreters. So a nice picture for you to remember this. Compilation is when you take the whole source code, compile it and link it into an executable program. Whereas interpreter takes one line, interprets it, executes it and then it takes the next statement. Another topic that comes under software in a computer is virtualization. Remember the word virtual means not real. In computers, when we talk about virtual, it's something that is not real, so it's generated by software. If you play a lot of virtual games, probably, that are in virtual environments, and you could have a very real looking screen which makes you feel like you're fighting a war in Vietnam. But it's all generated by software. It's not there for real. There are other kinds of virtualization. We've just spoken about virtual memory. It's not real RAM. It's RAM on the hard drive. There's virtual reality, virtual storage, virtual private networks we've spoken about. And virtual machines is what we want to talk about now. So um, with virtualization, we're going to pretend that our computer has other types of operating systems. And the picture here shows you, you could have a whole lot of different operating systems pretending that they are the operating system on your machine, but they're actually installed above your actual operating system that your whole machine runs off. Computers can run more than one operating system. Software allows you to create a virtual computer that runs on top of your current operating system. So you can install a completely different operating system and software onto the virtual computer. And then both operating systems and their software can run on the same physical computer at the same time. So this is what a virtual machine would look like. At the bottom you've got your computer. Then you have your host operating system like OS X. And above that you install virtual machine software. And then you could have a guest operating system like Windows operating above OS X or Linux or Google Chrome. So why do you want to go and do strange things like this? Um, you may wonder what, what the point of all this is. Well, if you were programming a new fancy app, let's say you want it to be the next killer app, something like Angry Birds or Instagram or even WhatsApp, and you want to make sure that it works on all versions of Windows. You want to make sure it works with Windows XP, Windows 2000, Windows Vista, Windows 7 and Windows 8. And you want to test it with all these systems, but you've only got one computer. You might also want to test it and see if you only have one CPU and one gigabyte of RAM. Would it work on that? So you could buy five computers and install these operating systems or you could use virtualization. So you have a powerful computer with a lot of RAM, so eight gigs of RAM and a terabyte hard drive. Then you install Windows 7 on the actual computer or Windows 10 say, you then install the virtualization software. 
let's say VMware and you create four virtual machines and install the other versions of Windows that you need on these VM virtual machines. So using now this one computer, you can test your fancy software, your new app, on all the different versions of Windows on one computer. You can also change the amount of memory, make it look like your computer only has one gig of memory, or the storage space, or the CPU power. So the point of virtualization is that it saves you a lot of money and a lot of time and allows, allows you to work more efficiently. So the virtualization software you could use would be something like VirtualBox, VMware or Windows Virtual PC.